You're broken down and tired of living life on the merry-go-round. And you can't find a fighter, but I see it in you, so we gon' walk it out. Move mountains, we gon' walk it out and move. Silence is a quiet, and it feels like it's getting hard to breathe. And I know you feel like dying, but I promise we would take the world to its feet. Move, bow our heads, bring it to its feet. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs> On behalf of the Departments of History and African American and African Studies and the Black Organization of Students, we present this activism and the activist event as part of Caring Community Week, an initiative that's hosted by the Office of Community 
standards and student development to highlight the many ways that Rutgers Newark and the student affairs team fosters a collaborative and caring campus community. This is also a kickoff event to our FM Week, an initiative that we launched about two years ago to showcase the value of a major and minor in African American and African studies. It also is our opportunity to present and showcase for the students more about our world-class faculty, interdisciplinary course offerings, and career pathways. If you're a Rutgers Newark student interested in how a major or minor could work with your plan, please add your name and email address in the Q&A box and we'll be sure to follow up with you. To give you a quick sense of the flow for the afternoon, we'll begin with a mindfulness exercise led by the wonderful leadership coach and yoga teacher, Loretta Turner followed by a conversation about activism with poet, writer, and our history graduate student, Dominique Rocker. Before we move into that mindfulness exercise, a few very brief notes, since I'm mindful that we only have an hour together. This event is being recorded for our archive and closed captioning is enabled. Please click on the closed caption, the CC button at the bottom of your screen to display subtitles or view full transcript. To ensure the comfort and protection of everyone that's participating here today, we needed to adjust our program a bit and change the format to webinar, but we still very much want to engage with you. If you have any questions or any comments, please do enter them in that Q&A box and we will do our best to respond as time allows. And with that, let's meet Loretta Turner. I met Loretta virtually when she led an invigorating mastering mindfulness session for the nonprofit POC Collective. And since sometimes as activists and as humans, we forget to breathe, particularly when the weight of the state of the world and work obligations feel too heavy. So we thought that she would be the best person to kick us off today. Loretta is New Jersey bred and San Diego based mindfulness and leadership coach and yoga teacher, the master's in nonprofit management and leadership. She's an active member of the nonprofit community, also as a seasoned professional and a devout volunteer. And she's always worked within human service organizations with the emphasis on mindfulness, compassion, and diversity awareness in all of her leadership roles. So what she says is true. It only works if you do. And she's always going to encourage you to go ahead and put that work in. So Loretta, thank you so much for arranging and rearranging your schedule to join us today. We really appreciate your time and look forward to what you'll bring. And with that, let's spotlight her. Christina, thank you so much for that introduction. It is a pleasure to be here and always a pleasure to get reconnected to my New Jersey roots. Um, you said so much that is true about mindfulness and activism. So I'm just going to piggyback on a lot of the wonderful things that you said. So hi, everyone. I'm Loretta, and I, I myself am an activist as well. And what I'm going to be offering you today is very small pieces of a mindfulness toolkit that I always use in a lot of different settings. And what we'll focus on today is specifically mindfulness from the point of view of activism. So as activists, we're, we are always on the front line for making change. And I know, I know I don't have to tell you all this, but sometimes the need to make that change can be, it can feel like a struggle. It can feel really hard and it can feel like you're putting up a fight, especially when you're up against some heavy resistance or just people who don't agree with what you're fighting for. And in fighting the good fight, we subconsciously start to put on armor. And that is a metaphor for saying that when we are out there fighting the good fight, our body might feel the need to tighten up and protect ourselves and protect our hearts and protect all of the other vulnerable parts of ourselves that we put out on display when we show up as courageous and determined change makers. And sometimes we don't realize how much armor we put on. We don't realize that and we forget the importance sometimes of having to relax and release and just let some stuff go. And then that's where the mindfulness comes in. So yes, my motto is it only works if you do. And that, and that is twofold. It does mean, of course, you got to do the work to get results, but it also means you can only do the work if you're functioning. So this mindfulness practice is really going to tap into that place of taking off our armor, finding that place where we can relax and release and fill our cups back up so that we can get back out into that change making place um, and becoming from a place of being more grounded and more relaxed and more mindful of how we're really feeling and the tension that we might've built up in our bodies. So we'll spend about 20 minutes together doing some breath work, 
a little bit of meditation, a little bit of movement. And then I would invite you to, to have a pen and paper or even a journal nearby, because at the other side of this, um, we're going to do a little bit of writing and journaling. So let's go ahead and get started. With any mindfulness practice, I first encourage everyone to make sure that they've got a clear, distraction-free, as much as possible space. And so that might mean closing the door, if that's comfortable, if that's available to you. If you've got any pets, maybe you guide them out of the room. Um, if you're not on your phone, I encourage you to put the phone on do not disturb, turn it upside down. If you're here with me through a screen, I would even encourage you to, to um, turn off the monitor, right? Just try to clear out your space as much as possible. And then the second thing I always invite people to do when we're tapping into mindfulness is to get comfortable, right? We're gonna be here with one another for the next 20 minutes and we are going to primarily be seated. Um, if you wanna stay seated, that's great. If you prefer to lie down, that's a wonderful way to tap into mindfulness, to feel super relaxed. You can even be standing, regardless of what shape you take, just make sure you're comfortable. I'm seated, so I will speak from that place. I've got my feet firmly on the ground underneath me. I'm seated up against a wall. I'm allowing my spine, my body to relax against what's behind me. And the first thing we'll do in this mindfulness practice is a guided meditation with some breath work and movement sprinkled in. And so if you need to kind of shift and fidget a little bit, roll out the shoulders, roll out the wrists, shake out the hands to so just allow yourself to land and settle into a more still place. And all mindfulness practice practices are inner work practices. They are internal practices. So I encourage people when we do this work to close the eyes. And if closing your eyes isn't available or just isn't comfortable for you, your alternative is to just find a soft gaze. I like to do it like right off the tip of my nose, right, right at whatever is below me and just keep the gaze there. Now let's start to bring some attention to our breath. We take something like 20,000 breaths a day. Most of them, if not all of them go unnoticed, which I find to just be so ironic because that's our life force, right? That's the thing that keeps us going. It's the first thing we do in this world and it's the last thing we do before we leave. And so let's take some time to be in appreciation of our breath. Notice the temperature of your inhales as the breath enters the nose. Follow the breath as it travels down through your airways and into your lungs. And then notice what happens in the body when you breathe in. Notice the expansion. Notice how your diaphragm pushes your organs away to create space for all that air. And then notice on the exhale, that passive process, how the air slowly exits the lungs like a balloon is emptying air back out through the airways. And then once again, noticing the temperature of the air as it exits your nostrils. And breathe just like that a few times, really intentionally paying attention to what it feels like to breathe in. And what it feels like to breathe out. And if you find yourself getting distracted over these next few minutes during our mindfulness practice, know that that's okay. Know that that is normal. You can use that mindful breath, that mindful inhale and exhale to come back into the present moment. That's all what mindfulness is all about, being present, being in the here and now, the, check, the checking in with yourself, with your breath, with your body. And 
And so bringing back this idea of having on armor as activists and using that image as a metaphor for the places where we hold tension in the body when there's just a lot going on, when we feel like we're stepping into battle, when we have to be vulnerable and put ourselves out on display when we're being courageous. Let's start with the armor that we might have put on our heads. And notice for yourself what that might look like. What does your armor look like around your head when you're protecting your head, your mind, your thoughts, your face? And now I'll invite you to slowly visualize taking that armor off. And it, if it serves you to physically pretend that you're taking something off of your head, a helmet of some sort, that could be useful in this meditation. And imagine that you're doing that and at the same time, you can start to relax your forehead. You can relax the space in between your eyebrows so you're no longer scrunching your forehead. Relax your eyes, relax the eye sockets. Relax your mouth. It might even help to open the mouth wide and slide the jaw side to side. Relax the jawline, relax the ears. And again, adding this as you're mindfully relaxing the face, mindfully releasing bring to mind what piece of armor that you just took off there. And now let's start to do the same, this time bringing the focus to the shoulders. Right away, what's your armor? What do you got on the shoulders that is protecting you? And whatever it is, just start to visualize you peeling it off piece by piece as you relax the muscles of the neck, relax the front of the shoulders, relax the tops of the shoulders, the sides and the backs of the shoulders, just letting it all drape and fall off. And now let's shift our awareness again, this time to the chest, an infamous place to hold armor, an infamous place to hold tension because that's where the heart is. And once again, imagine what armor do you have on there? What shield protection do you have across the chest and behind the chest? What are you protecting behind your heart? That blind spot area. And then using those deep breaths, once again, to piece by piece, just peel it off, take the armor off in front of the heart, take the armor off behind the heart, to fully relax the muscles in your chest. And let's shift the awareness now into our ribs and into our organs, our bellies a place of the body that holds so much vulnerability because it holds our and houses our organs. And again, visualize what's the armor that you have on there. What tension has built up, maybe those knots in your belly. Identify those if you ever get those. And use your breath to allow yourself to relax and again, visualize or even physically just take the armor off around the ribs, around the belly. And we'll shift the awareness one more time into the low back and into our hips. 
That is where a lot of tension and a lot of stress gets stuck. Especially when we physically feel like we have to step into these challenging places and really fight for what we believe in. The hips, the back can get really tense. So once again, visualize what is the armor that you're keeping there. And use your breath to gently just remove whatever armor is there. Relax your hips. Relax the muscles in the lower back. And now just be with yourself here for a moment, noticing what it's like to have visually, metaphorically, taken all that armor off. Allowing yourself to be in a more open, more relaxed place. And then we'll use that space to take three deep cleansing breaths to help us stay open. The next time you inhale, breathing your arms out to the side or forward as you reach your arms up and overhead. And when you exhale, open the mouth and let an audible sigh come out as you drop the arms alongside the body. Do that again, inhale, lift your arms up and overhead, exhale, <sighs> drop the arms alongside the body. One more time, inhale, arms reach high. And exhale, sigh, <sighs> allowing yourself to release, to let go, to relax. Again, being in a space and just feeling the sensation of having metaphorically taken off all of that tension, all of that armor. When you're ready, you can start to blink your eyes open and bring your attention now to that pen and paper. And we'll spend just two to three minutes here allowing ourselves to be in a place of reflection and perhaps reflecting on whatever came up for you during that movement and during that meditation. And you can answer questions such as, where was I holding the most tension? What did my armor look like? And you can get really specific. What color is it? How heavy was it? Where on my body did I have the most armor on? How do I feel now that I've taken my armor off? And I'll repeat those questions one more time, just so they're fresh in your mind. Where was I holding the most tension? Where did I have the most armor on? What did my armor look like? And how do I feel now that I've taken it off? Let's take one more minute to just reflect, to write, to share via pen and paper whatever is coming up.
about 15 more seconds here to get those last thoughts onto paper. And then for the remaining time here, the uh, Q&A box is open. If anyone would like to share their experience or ask any questions about that meditation or mindfulness in general, an invitation to just keep the conversation going with one another before we transition into the next section of this gathering. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any questions or comments. So thank you all for allowing me to be with you this afternoon and allowing me to guide you. Again, my name is Loretta Turner. It is a pleasure to have been able to offer that for all of you. Um, what a wonderful experience to be able to merge the, this or bridge this, this um, wonderful way to talk about mindfulness with an activism. I hope this was helpful. And if any questions or anything else comes up between now and um, the end of our time together, feel free to follow up with Christina and uh, she'd be happy to send anything my way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lara. I hope you all that are joining us um, virtually were able to do the exercise and just take a breath uh, because we, we all need to do that. Thank you again so much, Lara. I appreciate that. Um, have a wonderful rest of today. I hope you might be able to stay a little longer, but I know you're also in demand and have another <laughs> event right after this one. So I promise not to, yeah, give you any side eye if you need to step back. <laughs> Thanks Thank you, again. Christina. I appreciate it. Um, and with that, we're going to kick off our conversation with um, activism, which is, is what we're here to, to really get into. And the best way to kick off is with introducing Dominique. Uh, Dominique Rocker is a poet, writer, and a first-year master's student here in the history department. We we're so glad that she chose to, to join us. Uh, Dominique actually holds a BA in print journalism from California State University Fullerton and a master's in African-American and African studies from UCLA. Between those degrees, she attended De Anza Community College in the Bay Area, whereas when she actually began her organizing work. At UCLA, she became president of the Black Graduate Student Association and an advocate for Black students. She also worked as a teaching assistant for two years and in her final semester at UCLA, TA'd for the sociology of criminology. Actually had to spend the first full quarter on Zoom due to the rise of Corona and uh, throughout the summer, Black Lives Matter uprising. So she's been very busy. Her research at UCLA actually examined the activism and resistance strategies of Black women in the Black Panther Party in LA and New Haven, Connecticut. This work focused on both the narrative and erotic resistance via oral testimony and written poetry of former Panther Erica Hudgens. She used the lessons learned from her research on Hudgens as strategies for centering care in resistance as an activist which is why she's invited, <laughs> uh, and for other students trying to navigate a new learning environment in the midst of this pandemic and social upheaval. So in thinking about pleasure as a site of resistance for Black women, um, particularly as Black women also must negotiate a sexuality enmeshed with pain and trauma, Dominique's interest shifted to questions about Black women in pornography in the digital age and the potential for censoring queer pleasure as a radical resistance site. So lots of... <laughs> Lots of interesting work. There's so many things that, that we can talk about, but we only have half an hour. So I want to drill down a little bit to get started in what actually motivated you to begin your activism work and why did you decide to focus on the Panthers? Yeah, thank you, Christina. So uh, I 
went to, between my degrees, as you mentioned, I went to De Anza Community College. Um, and the reason is because I had a, a degree in journalism and I knew I wanted to go to graduate school, but I knew I did not want to go for journalism specifically. So I wanted to explore history and the history of social movements. And so I, in the, uh, in January of 2016, I enrolled in a few courses at the Anza Community College, one of which was a social movement history course. And that was a really uh, radical class. It absolutely shifted my trajectory um, for two reasons. One, we had a project in which we had to do community work as part of the class itself. And so I became involved in work at De Anza Community College that was combating sexual violence and sexual assault. At the same time, we also, our final paper was to basically do a historiography or to um, write about the history of a social movement of our choice or a social movement organization of our choice. And so I had heard very little about the Black Panthers um, in my previous history courses. And what I had heard had mainly just been that they were militant, violent, mostly men um, who, you know, walked around with guns and that was, that was it. And so I was interested in what else there was to be found in that story. And so I wrote for that class a final paper that was really a brief history about the Panthers. And what I learned was that actually a lot of the work that the Panthers did was community organizing specifically. And that's actually why the Panthers came into existence in the first place. Um, it was founded by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale in 1966, and they were both students at Merritt College in Oakland. And so I also say that to say that when you look at social movement history, a lot of activists are young and college students or on college campuses. Um, and so that really interested me as well. And then also as I was doing that work to the research for the Panthers, I found again that the main reason that they created the organization was to address a lot of the issues that they had seen in their community of Oakland, California. And so they began by patrolling the police, which is what you hear the most about in terms of them patrolling their neighborhoods armed and legally so um, with weapons that were then made illegal because Ronald Reagan as the governor at the time um, put in heavy strict gun laws in California. Um, they also did a lot of other organizing things that addressed community needs. They did blood drives. They did clothing drives. They had the free breakfast for children, which is one of the other ones that is more famous that they do. Um, they had community schools, which then became the Oakland Community School. They would bus to folks to visit family members in prisons. Um, and they also created medical clinics and things like that. So again, a lot of real addressing community needs that they were seeing were not being addressed by their government and particularly by the local government. Now, also in researching that, what I found was that a lot of the women were the ones that were running these programs for a variety of reasons. One is definitely that women are seen to be more nurturing and caregiving. And so those were the roles that they were given. But it is also because the Panthers, as they were being targeted by COINTELPRO, which is the counterintelligence program from the FBI, uh, a lot of the men of the movement were being either assassinated or jailed. And so that did open up space for the women to step into these leadership roles and run the community program. So that was really how I got my interest in both the Panthers and in community activism in general was, again, through that class specifically. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, with, with all of the strife and, and what we've been seeing with uprisings, again, it seems, you know, as we say, history keeps repeating itself. And we think, you know, we, for every step forward, sometimes there's a step back, but how have you stayed determined to, to do the work and what's been motivating you? Yeah, so uh, when I went to UCLA, um, that also is a campus that is enmeshed in Panther history specifically. Um, there are two Panthers who were murdered, assassinated on that campus in Campbell Hall, Bunchy Carter and John Huggins. John Huggins is the husband, was the, the husband of Erica Huggins. Um, Erica was from Connecticut originally, both her and John were from the East Coast and they had moved to California to specifically join the Panther organization. And John and other Panthers were students at UCLA, as I mentioned, so that's why they were on that campus. Um, after John's murder, Erica was actually targeted along with other Panthers for that murder specifically. And not only her, but she and John had a child that was born, I think three months, months before his murder. Um, the police even 
arrested, created an arrest record for that child. So she left Los Angeles, went back to New Haven and was tasked with creating a chapter in New Haven. Um, I'm saying all of this to say because my interest was really in her and there was a conspiracy trial that she was involved in around the New Haven chapter. Uh, I'm not going to get into the real specifics of that because that's going to take us away from, from what we are focusing on now. But it's to say that I began researching her trial and she was incarcerated throughout that trial. And that was really what I was interested in is how she navigated both this conspiracy trial and an incarceration as a new mother and as a new widow and as a young activist in the Panthers. And what I found was a lot of rich knowledge, much of which Loretta led us in just earlier, which is, was really, really beautiful for me. Um, a lot of what Erica used, these mindfulness tools, she used meditation, she used movement, she used writing, she wrote a lot of poetry. Um, mentioned in my introduction, the oral history as well. And that is because she took the witness stand during her conspiracy political trial to talk about the targeting of John and herself by the police and how that also was part of this larger story. So it was also really about her reclaiming the narrative of her life and of the Panthers in general. So that is really what keeps me engaged in the movement is the narrative work, the reframing and really thinking back to what we know or think we know about history and what we really more don't, particularly as it pertains to Black history and particularly as it pertains to activists who were targeted in the way that the Panthers were, and then the narrative that they were given or that was put upon them were these violent, um, militant organizations. Whereas what I learned from Erica was the complete opposite. It was mindfulness and it was it was poetic, truly. And so she really was that motivation for me. And then it also is for me because I am deeply interested in Black liberation as well as Black history. And so those two things are what keep me engaged in this process. Thank you for sharing that. I know that we have uh, some students that I could see a little bit on, on, on the chat and I recognize some of these names. And um, with that, I wanna just ask a little bit about what are your thoughts that you have for students or for anyone that's thinking about ways to get involved and, and being more active because we're hearing the word activist thrown around a little bit more. And there is a difference between those that actively engage to, to, to make change and those that support these efforts, right? So yes. if you can just talk a little bit about um, how, what ways would you recommend for younger people, students and, and anyone in the community to get involved Involved, but not necessarily sure about where to start. So I'm going to drop a resource into the chat for folks. Um, it's going to be a link. And um, this really, particularly as the uprisings of 2020 in the summer uh, kicked off, as you mentioned, I was teaching a course, Sociology of Crime, and there, the students in that class were really concerned, A, about what was, what they were seeing in the world. And how to get involved, particularly as it was also occurring during coronavirus pandemic. So not everyone is able to do the kind of activist work that we first think of when we hear activism, right? Like we think of marches, we think of sit-ins, we think of physically going out using your body in some way um, to either draw attention to or to create some sense of interest in a movement. And that is absolutely vital, but it is not everyone's role. And so I use this map, which is not mine. It was created by Deepa Eyer, I think is how you say it. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Um, and the Building Movement Organization. And this I shared with my students in that class and they found it really, really helpful. The, re the link that I included also has a download. So you can download this map as well as a reflection guide that can help you see where you fit on this map. So for me, again, because I am very interested in history and in narrative, my talents fall into the storyteller arena. My talents also fall into the guiding arena where I'm not going to be out in the streets necessarily, although I have done that work. 
I found that my talents are best used in these other ways to help guide folks and to to tell the story because that is, as you mentioned, just as important. Um, so folks can use this resource to to narrow down their talents and to see where those talents fit into this whole ecosystem. Because the other important part is that every piece of that ecosystem is vital to creating social change. You do need frontline workers who are out in the streets, who are advocating for folks, just as much as you need people who are caregiving for folks who cannot necessarily be out in the streets. Um, you also need folks like me who are going to be telling these stories, who are going to be letting the world know what's going on in real time. You also need people who are going to be healers. Activism is traumatic, can be traumatic, it can be harmful. And so you need folks to, who are able to do that, like Loretta. Loretta is a perfect example of a healer. So I encourage folks to, on their own time, look at this resource, download that resource, and go through the reflection guide. That will really help them find where, where they fit and then help them see how they might navigate their particular position in, in this whole ecosystem. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. I know I'll definitely check that out <laughs> uh, myself. I think uh, two things that I want to mention right now is that one, for those that are just joining us, I see some, some additional names pop in. I'm, I'm glad to see you all, thanks again. Uh, this event is part of Caring Community Week, as I shared at the outset. Um, and so if you'll see why we focus more on obviously the history piece because She's but a historian, um, but also really the care piece, because as Dominique and as Loretta shared, um, this hard work is, is draining. It's physically taxing, it's emotionally taxing, and it's important that all of you uh, take care. And, and so one of the things that our, uh, this Caring Community Week will help you do is they'll run a series of other events this week um, that would really focus on how we collaborate and, and foster a, a caring campus community. And so we do have resources, uh, also an incredible a counseling center that offers different types of programs as well, because we do want you all to be able to take care of yourself. Uh, we only have about 10 minutes left. <laughs> Uh, so um, I did, this hour went, went by quite quickly. So I, I want to see if there are any questions or anything in the in the chat or Q and A box. Um, we did have oh wonderful. So Jose asks, how would you best describe your experience as an activist? Yeah. So I, I really love that this event highlights care because. Um, I unfortunately at this moment can't remember what who the quote is attributed to, but there is a quote that is essentially like, you cannot engage in the work if you aren't engaged with yourself. If you aren't taking care of yourself, then you can't be in that work. So my experience as an activist has really definitely been a draining experience, I'll say, particularly at UCLA, because that is a predominantly white institution. And Black students have traditionally had a lot of uh, issues on that campus, um, and particularly in trying to advocate for themselves. The, the UCs, some of them have Black resource centers. UCLA was not one of them, and they had been advocating for a center like that for, honestly, decades. Um, and we were able to finally get that started right in when I was the president of Black Graduate Student Association. And the Black Lives Matter uprisings in summer 2020 is what solidified it for the university to move forward and give them an actual dedicated space for that, um, which you can see, or you can probably assume that was a real pushing point for them. So my experience working with administration was difficult. It was definitely draining. And that is why I learned a lot and used a lot of the tools that I learned from Erica Huggins specifically about taking care of myself and also then used it with my students. So that experience using it with my students was also really beneficial. They really seemed to appreciate both this that I've just shared with folks here, as well as I would do mindfulness um, similar to what Loretta led us through earlier with them as well. So I would say that 
though the experience could be difficult, it also was absolutely really rejuvenating when I implemented the care and when I also had folks who were doing that work and taking care of themselves along with me, for sure. Thank you. Um, so we also have a couple of comments and one is thank you for the session. It was very relaxing. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, another that I'd like to answer live is I like this question. Um, if you lived during the time, would you have been a part of the Black Panther movement? You want to take that it? question? Yeah, <laughs> I actually was really reflecting on that yesterday when I was thinking about this. And I mean, it's hard to say, to be honest, because in your 21, 2021 self, um, you would think a certain way that you may not have thought if you were at that time period. However, uh, that said, I do think I would have. I do think I would have joined, especially um, being from Southern California and also living in the Bay Area and, and in seeing Oakland specifically, I think I would have joined the Panthers. And I think it would have been really for that community work as well. I view myself as a nonviolent person. I don't necessarily advocate for violence. However, what the Panthers were advocating was not violence for violence sake, but rather for self-defense. And in those ways, I can see why they ha held that position. And I think that I would have affirmed it, even if I myself would not have participated in that aspect. But I absolutely would have participated in the free breakfast program. I would have participated in the, the educational uh, community schools as well, and in the various ways that they were taking care of their community. Because that is the activism that I still am engaged with today, is thinking very concretely and specifically about community needs and how to address those in real time. Thank you. I couldn't have said it any better. I also would. <laughs> Uh, oh, okay. So, oh, I like this one too. Another good, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is there such a thing as what's considered to be the right way to be an activist? We hear that a lot. So you want to want to take yes. it first? <laughs> I'm going to give a short answer and then a long answer. I think the short answer is no, um, because I think that when you are advocating for social change in any capacity, you are going to meet resistance. It's going to be difficult change is difficult. And so we we can see this, even if we look again back at the variety of ways, and if I'm thinking specifically about Black history, because that's what I know, there's a variety of different ways that Black folks have engaged in social change. And I would not say that any one of them has been met with uh, being a right way. So if you even think about Martin Luther King, he was not in his time seen in the way that we see him today. He was also tracked by the FBI. He was also targeted very specifically. They did a lot of what they did with the Panthers in terms of creating false documents in order to try and create uh, tension within him and his organization. So you see someone like Martin Luther King, who now folks are like, yes, nonviolence. And, and even to that, um, folks like Martin Luther King are really collapsed into a monolith of nonviolence, whereas Martin Luther King's actual views and actual engagement in social change was much more nuanced and broad. So that's one example. You look at the Panthers, which I've said, they obviously were not met with uh, this uh, real sense of them doing something for their community, which is what they were doing. Colin Kaepernick, also not met with real, uh, like he was not seen as someone who was doing something worthy, although all he was doing was being peaceful and nonviolent in the ways that we now say that Martin Luther King was doing and that we now rejoice Martin Luther King for doing. So I would say, especially in the time period, um, there is not necessarily a right way that is seen as being an activist because you are most often asking for something that at the time is not seen as legitimate. And I, I'm stressing at the time, because again, when we see in hindsight, we often see that perception changes. Great answer. So I think we, we have time for, I like this question. You had just mentioned this the other day. So what did you think about Judah and the Black Messiah? You, <laughs> I haven't seen it, but I know you have. So if you wanna talk a little bit about that. Yes, as I, this, is a, this is an interesting question. Um, I will start by saying that Elaine Brown, who was a Panther and was chairman of the Black Panther Party, 
she tweeted that um, Shaka King, who's the director of Judas and the Black Messiah, does not speak for the Black Panther Party. And so I think that that in and of itself says a lot. I will say I, I did watch the movie. I did think that it was better than I expected it to be. Um, but I will still say that Hollywood is Hollywood. And when Hollywood portrays Black history in particular, it does so sort of with these rose colored glasses. And with Judas and the Black Messiah, what is important is that Fred Hampton was assassinated by the FBI because of an informant that's Judas in the film or William O'Neill, um, who for better or for worse or whatever his conflictions were, you know, he um, was sort of scooped up by the FBI because he himself was a criminal and they used that leverage to have him be an infiltrate and informant. He himself was also very young. He was 17 when he was initially brought in to and recruited into the Panthers. At the end of the day, Fred Hampton was 21 when he died, same age as William O'Neill, and they made completely different decisions. What I, what I personally did not like about Judas and the Black Messiah is the way in which they really made William O'Neill a the center and also a redeemable character in many ways. And as somebody, again, who studied the Panthers, and that that was also a large part of my thesis and my research because it had occurred in 1969. 1969 was a very violent year for the Black Panthers. 1969 was when the Erica Huggins trial and conspiracy was happening that I researched. It was also when Bobby Seale was on trial in Chicago, which was also um, made into a film, The Trial of the Chicago Seven. And during that trial, he was literally bound and gagged in a federal courtroom. Um, and so I'm saying this to say that I, I don't think that Jesus and the Black Messiah does a, a fair justice to Fred Hampton and his his real politics, because he was very, very socialist as the Panthers themselves were. They were socialists and communists. And that's not also something that is discussed when Panther history in general is discussed. And also because I think it's important that there is a more nuanced discussion around Black folks who were used by the FBI in these very particular ways, in the ways that William O'Neill was, because at the end of the day, he was aware of what was going to happen when he provided the floor plan to the FBI, which then led to the assassination, uh, the assassination itself. So I think it's a good movie in terms of getting the general story but I absolutely encourage folks if they watch that movie to also listen to Fred Hampton's speeches specifically um, because he was a really powerful orator and he was really doing a lot for Chicago specifically that I think the film touches on in terms of him trying to unite folks in Chicago, but I don't think it does it justice. Just as I said, I don't think that any Hollywood film is going to do it justice. Well, with that, I'm not sure that I'm good. I'll see it. I'll definitely watch it. <laughs> I, 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 I don't mean to say that it's like a terrible movie. It's a well-made movie. The acting is really, really good, uh, as you can expect from, you know, Daniel Kaluuya and Lakeith Stanfield. Um, so for those reasons, I absolutely would say it's worth watching. And again, if you don't know a lot about Fred Hampton or about the story in general, it is a good introduction. But I really stress that it should be an introduction and that you should then continue to research the Panthers specifically, to listen to their speeches, again, specifically Fred Hampton's, because again, he was really a powerful speaker and he did have a lot to say. Mm. Well, thank you for that. And on that note, um, we're gonna close and just with a couple of, um, of quick things, which is first and foremost, thank you no, <laughs> for coming, answering the call and, and coming on to, to share your experiences with us. Um, we're I'm very glad to have this conversation and hear from you. Uh, and I appreciate that. I will say if anyone, I think we answered everything. I hope there were some comments. We, you know, we appreciate you all for attending and I'm glad to, to see that you uh, enjoyed the session. If you have any questions or if you are a Rutgers Nork student that is considering a major or minor in African-American studies, where as you could see, <laughs> you'll become more versed coming out uh, of our program, I'd be happy to stick around for a little bit or or follow up with you by email if you want to put your name and email address um, into the Q&A or to the chat. It'll just be private. Um, the other quick thing I will say is that I'm putting in the chat here 
we have a full calendar of events this week, uh, including, which is extremely, uh, is a, just a capstone, the 41st annual Marion Thompson Wright Lecture. Okay, it's going to be virtual this year uh, for obvious reasons, uh, but they're talk about activism and organizing work. Uh, Elisa Garza and Cara, just so the lineup is incredible. As you might be able to tell, I'm super excited, but I want to get so much other information in there. Check out ethnicity.rutgers.edu um, to RSVP. It is this Saturday at 930. And um, they also have some giveaways planned too, some, some texts that would be important for the, the earlier logins. Um, last, the Caring Community Week is all week, and their link is in the chat. Uh, they have a couple of fun events, including Family Feud. <laughs> um, we have tomorrow an African American Studies Quiz Bowl, and uh, Rutgers and students, anyone really, they're open to participate um, to join us tomorrow at 2.30. And again, on that SASNF Family Week website, we have the links to get the Zoom room. Uh, some of our giveaways will include participants that come in and, and, and play uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X as read by Lawrence. <laughs> Did you have a chance to listen to that yet? Yeah, I'm excited about that. We have a few copies. So, so definitely log in early. Um, I feel like, oh, and I'm alum. Oh, thank you so much. This is this is beautiful. Uh, so, so our alumni have tuned in too to, to give comments and we're grateful for that. Last pitch on Wednesday, we have Whose Cities approaches to suburban and urban uh, perspectives with professors Mary Rizzo, who's a historian, but also uh, affiliate faculty in our African American and African Studies Department, teaching Black arts and cultural movements this semester. Uh, amongst all of her incredible work, she's also a uh, Chicory Baltimore poetry project. So check it out if, if you are on socials. Uh, I put in the chat, follow us at RUNFM and at Federated History. We repost Chicory all the time. And what we hope um because for us in fm every day is black history month <laughs> you know we're black history month 365 so we do try to post a lot of things that are relevant to the community um as we always close, you probably heard this before, we say we are the ones uh, because we're the ones that we've been waiting for. And we're not only in Newark, but we're of Newark. So lots of events that would be focused uh, for Newark and for New Jersey are there. So hashtags RUNFM Week and CCW 2021. Thanks again for, for joining us. We appreciate it. And if there, again, I'm happy to stay. If you want to add any email addresses or follow up, I'll get back to you, I promise. And with that, stay safe. Let's play a little Nina Simone to, to let us let us end. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks Thank you, Dominique. <laughs> Birds flying high, you know how I feel. Sun in the sky, you know how I feel. Breeze drifting on by, you know how I feel. It's a new dawn, it's a new day. It's a new life for me, yeah. It's a new dawn, it's a new day. It's a new life for me.